Amen. I'm going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 29 to 32. So good to have Michael here with us today. The poor guy didn't know any of us, but Carl's been talking about him coming now for about six weeks. <laughs> Amen. If, if you're reverent of God and his word, we stand for the reading of the word here. Sister Verdell, you stay seated. If you're ill or infirm or sick, please, by all means, stay seated. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I'm gonna get I'm gonna this is gonna sound like it's getting in your business. But Jesus came to get in our business. Because if he didn't, we'd be in trouble. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying. We've got to be careful how we speak. And if you've been around for our Wednesday nights, the teaching, you're going to realize what comes out of your mouth. Well, let me just use the word of God. We'll be judged by every idle word. We have to be careful of the context of how we speak. The paradigm that we establish. The type of people that we are. And he goes on saying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now he's going to get serious. We all deal with the struggles of life. We all have our own potholes, Dead man's curves, switchbacks, rough patches. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to one another. It doesn't say if you like them. It doesn't say if they're family. Some of you are great Christians with your family. But the world wouldn't know the difference. Your neighbors don't know. Are you hearing what I'm saying? One to another. Tender hearted. How about everybody? Forgiving one another. Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Anybody here been forgiven? Let's, let's place our Bibles down. And why don't we take a moment as I pray for this service and thank God for being forgiven. Lord, we love you. We need you. I need your help today as I bring forth this thought, God, that would help somebody, that would help me, help all the hearers, those that might hear this online in the future, God, that we would understand the, the depth to which you're speaking about our personal lives as individuals and not just the sweeping mass movement of humanity or Christianity. God, let us get the understanding and the fullness of this truth in our hearts that we would not allow that root of bitterness to grow in our lives. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Praise God. You can be seated. Before I get too far, when it says, be kind one to another. Rudeness is a weak person's idea of strength. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In Mark chapter 11, Jesus speaking at verse 24, he said, Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, 
when you pray, believe that you receive them. Listen, listen, listen. He's talking about praying and having a need. But he, he doesn't switch. He gives conditions because your heart matters in what God gives you. You, you. you can have the greatest kid on the planet, but if his heart's not right, you don't give him the keys to your house or your car. And you shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive. If you don't have nothing to pray for, you're already in trouble because there's someone, there's some bitterness, there's a situation. You might need to forgive yourself. I'm going to say something. You might need to get, get your mind and heart right. You've got to forgive God. You're upset at God that you had expectations of life that didn't work out in your mindset. Forgive if you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, heaven, may forgive your trespasses. Did you catch that? Well, he just goes ahead and makes it clear. But if you do not forgive, you know he did not break that down to what you forgive and what you don't. It's all of it. Neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Wow. My forgiveness that I need is contingent upon me being a forgiving person. That just, just changed the entire dynamic of my Christianity. Who I am. Romans, Paul speaking, chapter 5 and verse 8. The NIV states it this way, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were yet still sinners. Christ died for us. Wow. You see, if you come up and apologize, I can forgive you. That's not what Jesus did. You have, how many heard the, the term pay it forward? Nobody here on this planet, terra firma, in the last five years of that, ten years, that became popular. Jesus ultimately did that. Mm -hmm. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Romans 5 and 8 in the King James Version says, but God commendeth his love Toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. To be a Christian, according to C.S. Lewis, declares to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Amen. Hebrews 12 and 15 declares, looking diligently, paying attention, folks. Lest any man fail of the grace of God. Think about that for a minute. People like to take grace and say it's a, a salvation. It's not. It's a dispensation. It's, it's time. It's, anybody own a house? Anybody pay rent? You have a grace period. But trust me, if you don't get it done in a grace period, they're coming to collect. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble or pierce you thereby many be defiled. That defiled means stained, marked. That's what sin does. And as long as you don't forgive who and whatever it is that wounded you, that thing will take up residence in your life and it'll live rent-free in your heart and your mind. It will set up shop and it will get bigger. It'll order a living room set and a bedroom set and it'll, it'll squat right in your life if you don't deal with it. Because real forgiveness is giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. Forgiveness does not change what happened. It won't change the past, but forgiveness enlarges the future. He who cannot forgive 
breaks the bridge over which he himself must pass. George Herbert said that. Are you hearing me? The psalmist said in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law that he meditate day and night. It says, and he shall be like a tree. Everybody say a tree. Planted by the rivers of water. When metaphorically, we're being told that we can be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit. And you see, we have to be fruitful. Are you hearing what I'm saying? His leaf also shall not wither. No matter what happens, we're, we're, we're going to be fruitful. Not withered. We're, we're going to have leaves or we're going to grow and whatsoever we do shall prosper. Our, our Christianity is going to prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. The Bible talks about it in the They were to be tossed to and fro. The emotions, the winds of bitterness and struggle of being upset because maybe we feel that some things have happened to us that we feel were unfair. And therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. Righteousness is proven through adversity. Smooth sailors, smooth seas don't make good sailors. We find out what you really are by what you're going through. Who you are is determined by what you survive. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. My metaphor this morning that I'm about to get to is not original with me. Jeremiah referenced it beautifully when he said, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when he cometh. I'm connected to the source. What surrounds me doesn't affect me because what's in me is greater. If you don't know your Bible, I'm leaving some of you behind. Stick with me. But her leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought. You think about that for a minute. Things start drying up. People get tight. But when you're connected to God, when things around you dried up, you don't get dried up. You don't get embittered or embattled. You're still fruitful. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. It's talking about our Christianity. It's talking about our walk with God and what kind. See, Christians aren't problem-free people. Christianity is not a a fire escape or, or a exit stage left from issues. It's not that as that flowery pathway of ease. That's not what Christianity is. When trouble comes your way, that's not God leaving you. That just may be the moment when Satan came up and said, you know what, you got this servant over here. I don't know, they'll, 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 you do what you want. Watch what they do. And you stand firm and you stand faithful. And, and, and like Job, you show up for the class learn the lesson and come through to where God at the end of the story blesses you twice as much than you were before. All just to put mud in the eye of the enemy. Trees are used throughout scripture as metaphors. Job used it. Judges. We find it in Jesus used trees for teaching about agriculture, fruit bearing in his teachings. That being said, it was a nondescript morning. The old saying, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? I don't know. I would assume so. Perhaps it was a slight breeze or a sudden violent gust of wind. Whatever it was, no doubt it was with a thunderous crash and an incredible thud after years of standing tall and majestic. The great redwood came to a resounding end. Redwoods are the largest living things on the planet. You can find them in the Avenue of the Giants in California. I had the privilege of not only visiting there, but living in the area they call the Redwood Curtain. 
They are some of the biggest trees in the world, the giant redwoods in, of Northern California, the coastal redwoods and the giant sequoias. These are sometimes referred to as super trees. They can grow to be the tallest trees on earth. They, they produce lumber. They support jobs. They safeguard the clear waters and tributaries in the, in the hills and mountains where they grow, and they provide refuge for countless forest species. These stalwart sentinels seem to defy gravity as they stretch high into the sky. Some have stood for over 3,000 years. For centuries, the tree in our story stood and endured the elements, the changing weather conditions. It, it endured the seasons and all the changes that accompany them. Thousands of different insects had benefited from this great tree's strength. Animals and birds of all kinds had shared the life of this giant tree. The study of the great redwoods has revealed that many ecosystems have existed within their limbs. Many species have relied on the redwood tree and its root system for survival. But because of the quickly shrinking redwood forest, experts have cataloged and mapped the trees for study and recording. They've even named a majority of these great trees. So it's no wonder that when this tree fell, there was a great amount of curiosity and scientists wanted to study to find out what caused our tree to fall. When the experts began to study the fallen tree, they noticed something interesting. You see, they can study a tree by the rings and the cross-cut sections of the trunk. They learn interesting details. They know how old it is, and they can find the facts about the tree and its life. The rings tell them the age of the tree. The rings even reveal something of its history, the details of its life, which years were dry years, which years, years were rainy years with plenty of moisture, when it flourished, when it struggled. They can tell you which year's growth was good, the times when growth was minimal. When they cut into this particular tree, they, they notice an abnormality in the inner rings. It was determined that it was caused by, more than likely, a violent thunderstorm had come through, and the tree had sustained a lightning bolt that hit it. Although the lightning strike did not immediately kill the tree, it left a wound, an ugly wound. That tree survived that storm, and it still continued to grow. Yet because of the wound, that tree now became susceptible to a fungus that would attack and eat at the tree's integrity. Are you with me? The fact that sequoia trees can live for, well, we know, well over a thousand years, it attests to their ability to withstand situations, struggles disease. Even so, they are susceptible to several fungal infections. Redwood canker is brought on by a fungus. There's a botrysophira. Yeah, who knew? We're, we're worried about COVID-19 and the redwoods are out there thinking, oh God, I don't want to get trisophira. Is it over there? Let me get a mask. <laughs> That's a canker fungus. There's a armillaria, which is a root rot fungus. They're the two major pathogens that attack sequoia trees. And although our tree seemed to withstand these attacks, over time they had weakened the strength and integrity of the tree. And as the years went by and the tree still grew or aged, there began to be a slight, almost undetectable lean toward that wounded side. Much like unforgiveness in us, 
this past wound hindered the tree's ability to truly thrive and grow to its full potential like it could have. Slowly and almost invisible to the casual observer, the tree never reached its full potential. That wound hindered its growth. And although it seemed to have survived everything that life could throw at it, the weather storms, those droughts, the persistent attacks from fungus, that wound that never healed finally caught up to that tree. That tree compromised by that wound was no longer able to carry its own weight. I said it recently, don't ever become so big that you can't get over yourself to get where you need to be in God. Are you hearing me? The strong winds, the storms coupled together with this unhealed wound. This tree could no longer hold up to the normal elements of life. Just the normal things began to bother it, simple things, daily things, regular things that strong trees don't regard now started to cause it to suffer. Little simple things would irritate and bother and frustrate and irritate and aggravate its growth. It just, it just refused to grow because it was so caught up in all the little things that bothered it. Those roots could no longer hold. And with that subtle lean into that wounded side and the constant pull of gravity, once great tree succumbed to its wound and finally lost its battle to stand and hold its ground. I'm really not talking about trees. I'm talking about people. People who carry unforgiveness in their heart. Bitterness that develops in their mind. That tree grew weak like people and weary because a deep-seated wound that didn't heal. That great majestic tree simply toppled over. Never to stand again and sealed its own doom. The experts were able to look and tell exactly why this once great giant tree toppled to the forest floor after the fall. After. After the fall, it could no longer hide the evidence of what had gone wrong. Oh, I, I, I hope after, when it was too late. Let me tell you something, getting right and being right and staying right with God, you're not going to know if you don't make things right while you can. That past storm had left a wound and marked it, and it was left crippled. I, I, I've been around, I've, I've got 38 years of ministry in here, and I've, 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 I've been around, I've, I've watched, I've seen it, and I've experienced, and I'm just talking about me. That if you don't clear that up, you don't heal that. I, I've watched great pillars over the smallest thing topple within bitterness. Because although that tree was able, that person was able to conceal the wound through an exterior. The wound remained unhealed. You see, the giant redwood had suffered a wound that had never healed. It's not too much different than the Titanic. At 1140 on April the 14th, when she struck the iceberg, 
you couldn't even notice at first that she had a wound that was going to cause it to sink. Some doubted whether they should even get off the ship. You see, we have incidents. We have collisions in life. We have things that happen to us that, for the sake of my humor, leave a mark. We conceal them. We hide them. We're good at it. Christians are the best. We, yeah, we come walking in here with a suit and a tie and nice shoes and dresses and you got your hair did and you got your right and left guard on and we come in here and man, I'm going to tell you something, music team, you guys were just wonderful today. Thank you. But I know because being pastor, there's some that are singing through pain and tears and struggle and you're worried about the bills. And, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. But, but And there are things that we face and things that we deal with. There are things that leave a mark. Loneliness, rejection, divorce, death, wounds, hurts, lies, betrayals. And like that incident that happened to this, this tree long ago, and though it's in the past and although everything looked okay, the birds still nested and rested in this tree. The, the wildlife enjoyed its shade and shelter. And although it still looked the same, and we sit around this room together with those that they look fine. And that incident may seem like a, just a memory. But it never healed. It never healed. It was just covered up. That moment of pain, that, that wound that would be the ultimate destroyer and end of its life, end of its future. The Apostle Paul, who, who understood the desperateness of, of personal issues and idiosyncrasies, idiosyncrasies between people and understood Oh, to navigate one another sometimes is a full-time job. And so he, he, he addresses this subject tenaciously in Romans 8 and 35. He, he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, that ought to be an attitude he's talking about here. Shall tribulation, shall, 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 shall distress. What are you going to allow to get in there and remain unhealed? or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But he says, nay, those are just the things of life. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. I've always wondered what more than a conqueror was. You see, more than a conqueror is someone that not only conquers what they're going through, but they're going to tell you today, you can conquer yours too. They're going to be someone that doesn't tell you about their bitterness. So you join them and, and weep and, and sit there and stew over a, a bunch of things of life that happen. A more than a conqueror, take you by the hand. Come on, we're living for God. In the old, are you going my, let's go this way. Let's believe God. Let's let him heal us and move on and find somebody else that we can help along the way through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, hallelujah. What an, what an amazing passage of Scripture placed in context uh, that we daily need when, when you face it. And all, nay, and all these things are more than a conqueror. We quote it in times of trouble. We, we lean on it in times of pain, and we, we pray it 
in times of failure and we cry it in times of loss. And I, I'm thankful to know that nothing is able to separate me from his love. It motivates us to keep believing no matter what comes against us in life. The, the, the one constant thing that we can rely on, that we can have, the, the one thing that we know that we can take to, to the bank, as it were, is the love of God. God's love is manifested in his forgiveness towards us. And that's it right there, isn't it? That gets you through the day. And not just any day. I'm talking about your worst day. That, that's the one right there when you've been a complete idiot. When you've been a bonehead. When, when you flat out know you've been wrong and downright nasty and bad. And you, know what, you know what gets us back? He's faithful. He loves me. He cares. We count on it, don't we? We're able to keep going and we get up and dust ourselves up because his love is faithful. And if his love is faithful, his forgiveness is sure. Oh, we can keep going when we've been forgiven. We can keep going when we know he'll go ahead and erase that mark and remove that mark and touch that wound and heal. Oh, when he reaches in and heals that wound and bring back that strength. Oh, let me read that verse again. I read earlier in Romans 5 and 8. Mark it in your Bible. Get up tomorrow morning and read it again. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were in the midst of wrong, while we were messing up and making mistakes and maybe got a little embittered or embattled, oh, his love held on when I couldn't in the midst of sin, in the midst of struggle, that love beckons me close. He urges us to get up. Keep going. You do your part. I'm always going to do mine. <laughs> Keep pressing forward. I'll heal that wound if you give it to me. I don't know who said it, but I promise you, if you'll give him all the pieces to your heart, he'll heal it. But you got to give him all the pieces. He urges us, keep going, keep it up. Nothing that happens to any one of us should be able to separate us from the love of God. Oh, but I've got to be truthful today. I've, I've got to bring something out in Scripture today and cause some of you that think you got it all sewed up to get your cerebral cortex back involved in this thing. And a careful reading will shed light and let us see that there is one thing that's not directly mentioned. It's something sinister that can eat at you like a cancer or a fungus. It's easily hidden underneath the surface. It can lie seemingly dormant. That if left alone, it will continue to do its work. Like a root of bitterness springing up, it'll trouble you. Many be defiled or stained. In this discourse, Paul doesn't mention our past wounds. Go read it again. He did not. It never made mention of our past. And he wounds. Injuries, rejection, betrayal, loss. This a, Paul understood our past would haunt us and hurt us and even hinder us the most. Paul understood well the, the dangers of allowing an incident to fester unhealed in our lives. Paul understood suffering. We we have a record of the notable sufferings and struggles that he endured. 2 Corinthians 11 documents a, a lengthy list of, of reasons that he, he could have been embittered. 
And it's interesting that we have that chapter, but it's the following chapter that Paul gives us a gift because we get the answer. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, he, he, he makes a wonderful statement that actually probably epitomizes one of Paul's greatest statements. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, <laughs> My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest on me. Therefore, I take pleasure. Wait a minute, Paul. This is where I get off this train. This is where we want to get off this bus. Hold on. Wait a minute. What are you saying? Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities. Paul, say it in soul. In persecutions and distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul knew well the healing power of forgiveness and the strength that we receive when we let go and refuse to become angry, bitter, and even hurt. Paul knew disappointment would fester if we didn't forgive, when, when we don't allow the things to fester. Paul didn't hold grudges. He forgave. Oh, Paul called himself the chief of all sinners. I believe Paul realized that people would struggle with being able to overcome the wounds and hurts afflicted by others. Who are we talking about? Paul? I think he knows what he's talking about because he's been on the wrong end of this thing. Because we call him Paul, but before he was. He persecuted the very people he's writing to. He put them in prisons. He executed them. Now he's on their side. Nobody understood the power of forgiveness greater than Paul. Nobody understood the importance and what a big deal forgiveness really is. Then, Paul, let me tell you, there is a need of healing for your past. Only through forgiveness can we heal the hidden fungus of bitterness. For forgiving those in your life that hurt you, that wounded you, letting go of situations and incidents that haunt you, that first, can you imagine as Paul is around family members of those he sent to prison? Uh, he's now leading those, uh, he, he family members that he'd executed and persecuted and tortured. And he's now a leader. Um, you got to understand when he walked among them, there had to be an element, uh, a gigantic, uh, undeniable element of forgiveness in that congregation. Oh, so, so maybe it's a bridge too far today. Those old, those old wounds in your life that hurt you still, wound you. You don't have control. Those old wounds that want to destroy your destiny, your future, and erode your life. You see, unforgiveness is like putting a hangman's noose around your own neck and yet expecting the person that wounded you to die. 
Forgiveness is the fragrance that the flower sheds on the heels of what crushed it. God made healing available to us. No matter what's happened to you. Not just physical healing, but emotional healing of past wounds and hurts, childhood wounds of abuse, adult wounds of betrayal. He's providing healing for us. Isaiah 53 tells us, Surely I've borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. This is a complete and total healing that's available for all past, present, and future. He was wounded for our transgressions. Our uh, wounds uh, are visible in the outer flesh. That there are cuts and scrapes and wounds in the flesh that bleed outwardly. Jesus was wounded and the blood flowed from his body and fell to the ground for our transgressions. The blood came from open wounds to, to heal our open offenses and sins and transgressions and even our intentional hurts. But he was wounded for our iniquity. You see, bruising occurs just beneath the surface of the skin. In all honesty, the worst wounds are the ones that aren't seen by the naked eye. The ones that damage a person deep within. Those inner emotional wounds, they, they, they are the ones that create the turmoil of mixed emotions of anger and bitterness and that stubbornness to sit there and move in the amazing presence of an almighty God. They're stuck deep within a person. Those emotional wounds are far more dangerous than the external wounds because you may not see that you're bleeding internally. It was caused by a wound inflicted within your inner person. Not everybody sees that wound or that bruise. We, we cover them up and hide them. I'm okay. But he still went to the cross to shed blood to heal those wounds as well. Because it declares by his stripes you are healed. I know that today many people are scarred inner scarring, inner wounds that need to be forgiven and healed. You've been wounded. Some of you have dealt with untimely deaths, divorces. You've been widowed, never chosen. And the pain is real in life. Disappointment, rejection, loss are all deadly. Uh, those, those, those tears of, of, of disappointment are real. The, those wounds are deep. I'm, I'm not downplaying what they are, but I am upplaying that they can be healed. The problem is that we've allowed years to go by. And the life has gone on and the growth life rings around your pain and you think you've learned to live with it. You cover it up with misdirection. You ignore it with busyness and other things to do. But all it would take is a sudden wind or a breeze, maybe a picture, a mention of the incident, a song, a word, a smell. No one but you knows what it is and can understand. It's it's just can be brought all back like it was just yesterday, by whatever it is that takes you there. I, I remember, and this may not be important to you, unless you're from Texas. I remember my first sip of Dr. Pepper. Mm -hmm. I, 
was with my dad looking at property that he was fixing to purchase when he retired from the military. And I went with him and we were looking at the orchards and the wheat fields and everything that was there. And we met the old man that was selling it, Mr. Butler, and walked into that little old kitchen where I had a breakfast of, of fried eggs, fried tomatoes, first, first thing. And then, and then, I was probably about seven or eight. You handed me. You got to understand, this is the 70s. She handed me, in a family of six, three sisters, my own whole can of pop. And I remember when he popped that lid on that Dr. Pepper. And I grab, I see it now. I grab, my hands are a whole lot older and uglier now. Grab that can of that first. I was in heaven for a moment. Wow. Why'd I say that? Because I can tell you to this day, not out of a bottle, but the moment I take it, because it tastes different. The moment I pop the top on a can of Dr. Pepper and that first sip, I am instantly back at that place with my dad, who I haven't seen since a teenager, and Mr. Butler, who's been gone for eons. At that moment, and just like that moment, there are things that take us back to wounds, to hurts, and we face them, and, and they're real. And we, we sit here today, outwardly displaying suits and dresses and displaying health, success, and even... Oh, we took the time to get ready today because we're going to make an appearance. And I'm thankful for showers and deodorant and cologne and perfume and toothpaste. Please, please. Definitely, we, we're for those things. But that mirror that we each looked at before we left to make sure we're presentable and we some of us are stuck there. I just want to appear like everything's okay. Can I tell you that, 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 that whereas I'm thankful for all of that, church isn't just for those that are okay. Church is not for you just to come here and like everything's all right and everything's fantastic because sometimes it's not. You can be sitting here suffering, scared, wounded, in pain, concerned that his healing and help is still available. I refuse to go through another service while not letting a sinner, the sick, or the wounded. He's still here to heal, help, deliver. He's here to fix it. He's here to help you, walk with you, talk with you, and love you. So for those of you today, I, want, I don't want to expose you, but inside, you're terminally weak. The inside, even though you're surrounded by an amazing family, you're perpetually crying, and you'll never show it on the outward. Oh, that your family would just wake up and get spiritual and see what you're really struggling and fighting with. Oh, that the church, that we'd all wake up a little bit more and spiritually discern. Too much time, uh, we've been allowed too much time to go by. And maybe you're sitting here and you think it's beyond an altar. Deep within your soul, if you'll listen. There was a longing for that hurt and that pain to finally be healed and be taken away. If you look at yourself in your life, you constantly feel that sting. The memories, painful memories from wounds that were inflicted long ago. Probably by a loved one. A family member, someone you trusted, believed in. You see, William Blake said it well. He said, it's easier to forgive an enemy than to forgive a friend. The 
the reality of what has happened to every individual in here is too great to speak out loud. We couldn't handle it. We couldn't handle what's in this room. I could spend most of the day mentioning all the things that are possibly in this place today. But I'm not particularly interested in promoting the wounds. I'm, I'm more interested in talking about your healing, your future. I believe that's what God is interested in. I, even now, I, 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 as we sit here making out like we're all right, and, and some of you already made up your mind, there is no way you're going forward. And that, that's you. Because I'm not trying to expose anybody. I know you don't want to express outwardly the inward wounds. God's good to me. I can honestly look and embrace each and every one of you. I love you. And I care about you. And God's a gentleman, though he will reveal things to me. I promise I will not exp I will I will never do anything to embarrass or expose you. But I I I I'm very clear. I know there are some in here that you have some wounds. That I almost can't bear to stand here and preach this message knowing you sit there with those. But I do know God wants you to know that he will heal your wounds if you will give them to him. Oh, Pastor, what do you mean? You see, it's all in how you're going to look at them that really matters. Years ago, I met a young man dying of cancer. His name was William Clark. I believe he was about seven or eight at the same time when I was grabbing that. We were scar buddies. I had survived some ridiculous things in my life. And I've learned something about scars. I have too many. Scars have the strange power to remind us that our past is real. However, you can let your scars forever be a reminder of your past hurts and wounds where they continue to threaten you. Or you can allow those scars to become a reminder of your healing instead of pain. They can become proof you survived. You see, even Jesus realized the inner struggles that people have that Thomas, who still gets a bad rap today, he said to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless. Touch my wound. See, that's the proof that Christ has power over wounds. You see, he had wounds, but he got up. He was whipped, he was scourged, he was thrust through with a spear, the, the bloodshed, the brutality. None of it was stronger than his love because of the power of his forgiveness. Look, Thomas, look real close and don't doubt. Look and have faith. Wounds won't destroy you. I've come to heal you. I've come to forgive you. And I can think that some of you can agree with me that when you understand a scar, then they're never really ugly. Because maybe the scar wants you to think or make us think that. But you and I must make an agreement to defy them, overcome them with love. And forgiveness, we must see all the scars as true beauty. That'll be our inner secret. It's our pearl. Because the scar does not form on the dying. <laughs> I, was, I was reading about this archaeological find. And doctor, I'm telling you, I can't imagine the brutality of wrapping a broken bone in copper 
3,000 years ago or whatever years it was, they literally found a femur. They dug it up and wrapped around that femur was a plate of copper. They had dug in and wrapped it around to support that femur. And when they pulled the copper off of it, they found that there had been healing taking. The whole point I'm saying is, he was healing. Scars don't come on people that are dead. Scars are proof you're alive. Scars are proof there's healing. Scars are proof you're not done. It's not finished. It's not over. A scar comes from the living, the surviving, the overcoming. Scars declare, I'm still here. You hurt me, but you didn't finish me. You wounded me, but you didn't stop me. The power of choice is in your hands. What will you do with your wounds? Scars show us where you've been, but they do not indicate where you're going. In fact, the scars that are left, you don't look at them the same. They now become proof you survived. <laughs> Scars are just another form of beauty. A painful story means the storyteller is alive. It's not a burial shroud or cloth. Instead, it's a tapestry of a life of survival and the power of God. Yesterday's wound is not an excuse to lay down and die. Rather, it's an opportunity to get back up to live a greater life. It, it is the epitome of another chance. When something that you thought could have defeated you didn't, it only delayed you because you're still here. What didn't kill you indeed makes you stronger. In fact, I phrase that another way. Uh, what tried to hurt me better run if it didn't kill me because I'm coming back. I'm coming back at you. Uh, scars speak more loudly than the sword that caused the cut. They're just scars. They're not you. They're a record of survival. They're proof. They, 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 are, they are the written record of I'm still here. Scars affirm the living. Mm. Look for God with everything you have. But the scars become the reminder that you're not only healed, but that you survived and that you lived and you are here. But the question is, in order to get that healing and turn wounds into scars, will you forgive and live? Will you set free and survive? Paul said, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. You see, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was me. I'm going to tell two stories and I'm going to bring this to a close. This one really marked me. Every day when little Timmy was being dropped off at school, Mother would get out, and give him a hug, and let him. In. Every time he'd turn around and go join his friends, they would all talk about the scars that covered his mother's hands and arms. And after a few times that, he finally came home, and he asked, "Mom, Mom, please don't get out of the car when you drop me off. Let me just, let me just go to my friends." They were always making comments about your scars. And being such a loving mother, recognizing the immaturity of a child, she acquiesced. So Timmy would get out and go join his friend throughout his day, and his mother would weep on the way home, loving that child that didn't know and understand the reason for those scars. But one day, when Timmy got a little older, and had enough of the comments and wanting his mom to stay hidden from his friends. Finally, in a, in a, in a moment, in an argument, disagreement, just made a comment about how ugly his mother was with those scars.
went off to his room. Mother went to her room crying. Finally, dad came home. It wasn't too long before dad came walking into Timmy's room and sat with him. And Timmy expressed his frustration again with the scars. And his dad asked him, do you know how your mother got those scars? No. He said, years ago when you were a baby and I was at work, the house caught on fire. And you were stuck in a room that was surrounded and it was your mother that ran in there. Pulled you out of that crib and sheltered you with her arms from the flames and ran out of the house. Save you. And the fireman literally had to grab your mother and put the flames out and his breath had ignited. And those arms that sheltered you are scarred because they sheltered you. And he burst into tears. He ran into the other room, grabbed his mother, and those scars forever took on a new meaning. I wonder if we understood the power of scars. I'm going to read you lyrics to a song. Told my wife is probably one of the greatest efforts and lyrics in Christian Christian song that I I have to say that I've ever read because some people will disagree, and that's fine. You can be wrong. I don't care. Uh, it should have won the Dove Award in 2013, but for some sad reason, some guy by the name of Matthew Redman with 10,000 Reasons won, but. Again, they can be wrong as well. The song about forgive it is the primary tenet of Christianity. It is that which it moves. It's the hardest thing to give away, and the last thing on your mind today. It always goes to those who don't deserve. It's the opposite of how you feel when the pain they caused is just too real. It takes everything you have just to say the word. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. It flies in the face of all your pride. It moves away the mad inside it always it's always anger's own worst enemy even when the jury and the judge say you got a right to hold a grudge it's the whisper in your ear saying set it free forgiveness forgiveness Show me how to love the unlovable. Show me how to reach the unreachable. Help me know to do the impossible. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Help me now to do the impossible. Forgiveness. Listen to this. It'll clear the bitterness away. It can even set a prisoner free. There's no end to what its power can do. So let it go and be amazed by what you see through eyes of grace. The prisoner that it really sets free is you. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Show me how to love the unlovable. Show me how to reach the unreachable. Help me now to do the impossible. Forgiveness. I want to finally set it free. Show me how to see what your mercy sees. Help me now to give what you gave me. Forgiveness. We hear the statement all the time. I'm waiting on God. And although we must strive daily to walk in step with his will, 
this statement is more often not an excuse for not doing something you know you should do. Take a look at your prayers. Too often our prayers involve or revolve around asking God to reduce the odds of harm, danger, or hurt in our lives. Make the way favorable for me. Remove those obstacles and remove the giants. Remove the Red Seas and the fiery furnaces, the lion's dens. Stop the struggles in the darkness. Amen. But just understand today as we all stand that just maybe God in his infinite wisdom wants to stack the odds against you on purpose so that you can experience the greater miracle. Maybe that enemy, that obstacle is there so that you will finally learn that you can walk by faith and not by sight. Maybe God wants you to defy the odds and step out in faith and, and to truly reach uh, that element of Christianity that's evaded you. God placed Goliath in front of David. The same God purposely downsized Gideon's army. And I'm going to tell on you some more, God. He allowed Daniel to be placed in a lion's den. Faith is not handcuffed by waiting on favorable conditions, but rather trusting God and having faith in him no matter how impossible the odds are you can be a constant wound of bitterness and woe in what happened to you. Or you can expose some scars and say we serve a God of forgiveness and healing. Watch me worship. Watch me give God the greatest glory by walking in grace and forgiveness to those around me. Listen, your destiny your victory is subject to you not waiting for favorable conditions and an elimination of opposing forces, but rather the conditions and opposing forces are subject to you and the favor you have with God as you walk with him through even the valley of the shadow of death. Again, if we are faithful to confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now I'm going to pull Paul, Paul, Paul Harvey on you. If the two girls had just left 15 minutes earlier, if the college graduate had taken another route, if he'd been in bed that night instead of drinking, their worlds may not have collided. Instead, the moment came in four seconds on Highway 98 near the Pensacola Bay Bridge on the day before Mother's Day, 2002. It was in the back of the ambulance that 24-year-old Eric Smallridge learned that two 20-year-old girls in the other car that he hit and struck were dead. The officials took a sample of his blood and placed him under arrest. Those two girls were coming home from a babysitting appointment. The small Ridge was coming home from time at a beach bar. When he first left to head home, his truck wouldn't start, and so he called his friend Mike to jumpstart him. And at some point, he must have seemed drunk because Mike asked, Eric, are you sure you can drive tonight? 
parents all already assured his friend he'd be fine. What he didn't know is he was going to end up crashing into another car. A car that was carrying two girls that Mike knew and regarded them as sisters. At the trial, Eric Smallbridge was found guilty on two counts of DUI manslaughter. He faced 30 years in prison in the courtroom. At a sentencing, of which I could only listen to a few moments of it, I had to stop. He cried so hard that his words to the girl's family was hardly audible. I've caused so much pain, he wailed. There's nothing I can do. He was sentenced to 22 years in prison, 11 for each girl. Now I have to talk about, hold on, you're ahead of me, buddy. This young lady's mother, Renee. When the trial was all said and done, you need to listen. She said, I've gone 56 years without a drop of alcohol. If you don't want your children to do that, then you can't do it. But after the trial, the verdict, and the sentencing, Renee fell into a, what she calls a dark place. In the midst of grieving the loss of her daughter, she realized that it wasn't only Eric Smallbridge that had been sentenced to prison. She found herself imprisoned in the darkness of bitterness. She found herself incarcerated with grief. She said it was the worst nightmare coming true. Everyone was suffering. So she finally grabbed the letter that she had received from Eric imploring for forgiveness and responded to it. And she wrote a letter of forgiving him. But she didn't just stop at the words. This grieving mother who lost her daughter and the other family finally realized Everybody was suffering. And so these families all went to the court system and they said, we want you to cut a sentence in half. She said, I have forgiven him. The courts need to forgive him. He put the next one up. This is the mother embracing the negligent young man that took the life of her daughter, her best friend. For two years, Matthew West had this story and he carried it around in his guitar case. He didn't know what to do. He was trying to write lyrics and write lyrics and write lyrics. And he finally was able to. Getting hold of the Department of Corrections. The Florida Department of Corrections allowed Eric Smallbridge to attend a concert that Matthew West was performing. Renee Napier was there because the lyrics of the song that I read to you were written based on this story of forgiveness. For two years in his guitar case, he wrestled with it and he finally penned those words that I read to you. And if you'll put the next one up, this is a picture of forgiveness. That's Matthew West told on the mic. That 
is Eric Smallbridge and Renee Napier. If you ever wanted to know what forgiveness looked like, if you ever wanted to know the power of healing, can I can tell you to this day, I looked him up. He got his life straight. He contributes the foundation for Renee. It didn't, wasn't just a moment. It wasn't just a prison conversion. The guy turned his life around. How? Forgiveness. You see, everybody was in prison. And it took a Renee Napier to realize we're all hurting. We're all in pain. There's a young man that made a mistake languishing in a prison. And she said, I'm at home languishing in a prison. And there's only one way out. There's only one way out for all of them. The guilty and the innocent. It was forgiveness. Forgiveness. Your bitterness can be let go by forgiveness. The pain can be released. Wounds can be healed. And scars can...